So um, so I am going to run through now the concept of Saul Colt's marketing risk. And it, this is sort of a, a, a new idea and not a new idea, but it's something that I've been playing around for a very long time with. And it's something I truly believe in. Um, and it's, you know, I think this is the exact way that you actually go out and find your first thousand customers. So. I like to start all my talks by setting expectations. Uh, as you can see from this email that I received, uh, you are in for something very special. This is um, just this is going to change your life. Hopefully, um, I don't guarantee it, but I assume that it's going to be close to changing your life. So. Um, the way I came up with marketing risk is three times in my career, I've taken a company from almost no users to a whole slew of folks using um, the products for those companies. Um, throughout my career, I've always been sort of flipping about, you know, how I make things things happen, um, really because it's part of my personal brand. I like to try to make things um I try to take super complicated things and simplify them, and I try to communicate them that way. And, and this is really, marketing risk is really no different. Um, and, and part of the reason I'm, I'm sort of sharing this stuff for the very first time is as I, I get a little uh, further in my career and get a little older and how things are changing with technology, uh, people really think you can do what I do with, you know, just a little SEO and, and some banner ads. So. I'm on sort of this one man crusade to um, show people that you really need to um, not put too much stock in just digital marketing and not put, you know, all your eggs in the creative side of things. You really have to use the the two as a team. So and, and I'm pretty comfortable to um, share this idea with people because I know that um, no one's going to work harder than me to make this work. So um, I'm really the best there is at what I do. Uh, so. This is going to be a presentation in two parts. Uh, the first part is, uh, well, the, the two parts are ideas and strategy. I, I like to do the strategy first because it's um, it's interesting, but it's not as interesting as the ideas part. So I like to sort of get the, the, the hard to swallow part out of the way first, or at least the complicated stuff out of the way first, and then just shower people with like the fun stuff and the ideas. So everything I'm about to tell you uh, goes on the the assumption that you have a decent product that anyone would care about if nobody is going to care about your product um, then you know this may not be the best use of your time and you should invest your time in actually fixing uh, your product or service so people care about it uh, so Saul Colt's marketing risk is exactly what it sounds like. It's based on the board game risk. I assume everyone remembers risk. Uh, it was a board game about, you know, world domination. Um, the very first marketing plan for a very popular um, software as a service company that I used to be known for was a world map. We sat down, we rolled out this map, and um, and this was our marketing plan. And, and people didn't really understand um how we did it, but the idea came from Sunir Shah and myself. Uh, Sunir is an incredibly brilliant guy who I had the great fortune of working with, um, but since Sunir isn't here, uh, I'm going to take credit for this idea, and um, hopefully I'm the only one you remember at the end of this talk. Uh, and of course, if you're looking at the slides, um, you see it says kidding, comma, maybe. That is really true. I really only hope you remember me. Um, so. <laughs> that aside, for those not familiar with um, the board game Risk, I already mentioned it's a game about world domination. Um, the whole point of the game is to continually be moving forward because if you aren't continuously moving forward, you're going to get crushed. And if you play defensively, chances are you get boxed in and, and you get conquered. Uh, it's not that different for when you're launching a startup or you're working at a startup or you're launching something new. For any new service or product, you have to constantly be moving forward because if you're not moving forward, things aren't going in obviously the direction you hope they do. Uh, so when you combine the two, when you combine the idea of the board game of risk and launching a product, um, that's where you get... Saul Colt's marketing risk. And um, I know you're probably super impressed at this point, uh, but it's only going to get better and smarter and um, easier to understand. Um, so what is Saul Colt's marketing risk? Um, it's an easy follow it's an easy to follow plan for building a great company that people care about and want to give you money. I always put the part want to give you money and I stress that so importantly uh, because you know, 
companies live off money. The I, I, I'm just going to make up a statistic because I don't have the actual number, but I'm going to say 99 and a half companies, uh, 99 and a half percent of all companies fail just based on cash flow. You know, it's wonderful to have a popular, trendy um, startup or app or something that you have a million followers, but if you can't keep your lights on and you can't pay your staff, you don't really have a business, you have more of a hobby. I'm a big fan of building businesses and profitable companies and things. And also, you know, when people are giving you money, they're actually customers. If they're not giving you money, it's something called a costumer because it's costing you money. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, sort of a weird place to be in when your customers or the people using your product are actually costing you money. Um, so here's how it works. And and so I, I, I've made up these fancy titles for subject uh, headers. They don't all make perfect sense, but bear with me. Familiarize yourself with the game board. When, when I said that our, our first marketing plan was a world map, uh, I'm actually being quite serious. And, you know, what we did was we, we, rolled this map out on a table and we thought of the areas as targets not continents so if you're looking at this world map and and you know we'll just pick one as you know north america for instance so you've got eastern united states western united states you've got alaska you've got central america you've got canada um don't think of those as those territories anymore don't think of the continents as continents think of them as targets so um what is the overall group or your product or service is chasing? Uh, and you make that your world. So it, it's sort of confusing, but the, the best way to explain it is uh, in my career, I've always been chasing creative professionals. I love creative professionals. They're my favorite people in the world. So, um, you know, creative professionals is this large, crazy, sweeping, you know, descriptive term for really, you know, hundreds of different types of people. Inside creative professionals, there are so many different roles. So what I do is I map out those roles and those people become my countries inside of the continent. So, um, Another way to sort of explain it, and I, I know this is sort of like complicated, but, you know, it, it will make perfect sense really soon. Pick your number one type of person that will be the low hanging fruit of your user base and make them Australia. When you're playing Risk, there's a lots of different strategies. One of the most popular is um, you want to own Australia first. Australia is an easy to defend country. There's only two ways in and out, and it's small and and you know not as desirable as something big and large. So everyone tries to own Australia first and grow from there. So uh, and again, just like I said, I'm going on the assumption that you know uh, your product is pretty good. Uh, also, I'm going on the assumption you know who your number one target is, because if you don't really know who your absolute best target is, you haven't done customer identification for your company, um, the next you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes is not going to make, or it's actually not going to be very helpful because it's super important that you've identified your, your customer base. When, when you're building a, co a company or you're building a marketing plan, the flow of it really is, you know, ABC, always be customering. And it's start with customer identification. Then you design your product, you develop your product, and then you market. If you're not doing it in that order, chances are you're, you're going to miss something somewhere. The product isn't going to be designed for the right people. You're going to be marketing, you know, something that doesn't really connect with the people you're looking for. So customer identification is always the very first thing. Um, but I digress. And I always think it's interesting that I, when I made this um, deck that I knew I was going to digress from the main topic there. So I made a slide just to make sure you knew that I knew that I was digressing. Um, so Back to the, you know, sort of the main thing we're talking about. Make a list of all the types of people close to your number one target, and you're on your way to building your board and your marketing plan. So let's pretend your number one target for your product or service is web developers. Similar to web developers would be mobile developers, web designers, graphic artists, um, user experience and user interface designers. Um, these people would be very, very close to your number one target,
Um, similar to those people, and these people could probably use your product, but it's a little bit of a jump away. And I use jump in quotes because it'll I'll explain that in the next slide. But similar to all those people, you also have marketing consultants and social media consultants and content creators and SEO and pay-per-click specialists. And the reason I say that those people are similar is because chances are they would attend the same type of conference or they would go to the same type of meetup group or they would you know have similar clients or they would have overlap in some way um, so they would actually you know run in the same circles but they're not exactly the same as a web developer or a web designer so when you're building out your board your risk board it would look a little like this you've got australia and you've got all those core people who are your number one group of people you've got your web developers they're the biggest then you've got mobile developers web designers you know that the next you know thing you're going to go for are marketing consultants and seo professionals but they're not in australia they're one jump away and that's really how you have to start thinking about things because the the way you win risk is you have to know where your next you know, move is going to be, but you have to own that first area first before you can make any move. So, you know, it, it really comes down to, you know, topic number two, build up your armies. You know, once you have mapped out your territories, and I only showed you a very small part of the map, you could fill out the whole world and, and stuff like that. I think you, you do it in small chunks just to not get distracted and things like that. But once you've mapped out your territories, your verticals, your targets, whatever, you know, phrases you want to use, you need to focus all your energy on that very first target. You can't just get distracted. You need to make friends. You need to make ambassadors. You need to get fans. You need to show them like you love their, you love them like they're the king or queen of the prom. That first group is going to be one of the most important things you do for your business. Um, in the example of Australia, you know, you'd market only to web developers and cater all your copy and messaging to attract them. They're your number one focus. And once you're getting traction, you move to the next small jump. And, in, in, you know, in this case, it would be web designers. You do the same with the copy. The reason behind the small jumps is that your first and second targets will be so close that traction in one will give you credibility in the second. And you can leverage testimonials from one to attract two. And, you know, and, and you know, you've got every time you sort of like make a little jump, you know, you can actually keep pointing backwards and say, hey, all these web devs love us. You guys should love us, too. If you have any questions, you know, here are some people that swear by us. Here are people that use us. Here are some shiny people that really love our product. Um, and, and by doing this and just keep rinsing, and repeating and rinsing, and repeating before you know it, you're going to own a continent. You'll be ready to to make a jump across the water. Now, I've super sped up the process and oversimplified this. There's actually a fair bit of work that goes involved in, in all this stuff, but you have to really, really focus on one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. Um, and when you are ready to make a water jump, and in this case to, to go to marketing consultants, water jumps are just as easy as you know building up that first area the only difference is that the water makes credibility less intimate and you need to then speak to different things with a new audience but you're prepared for this because you have a plan to build up a new army so it's all about just building up new armies and things so um and and just because you've jumped over to marketing consultants, you can never abandon Australia because the way you win is to keep your continents. The way you build your business is to keep these verticals very happy, very loved, very supported with a great product. And so I know I keep using Australia, and, and again, that's in air quotes too, and other geographical analogies, but don't get confused by that. Um, Saul Colt's marketing risk, and, and I love sort of speaking myself in the third person, it can be adapted for a city, a state, a country, or the world. So if all you care about is like three neighborhoods in, in your city, you can still use this plan for those three neighborhoods. Uh, you know, it's, it's really just changing the way you think about it and not getting caught up in the geography and just getting caught up in the verticals and the people you're talking to. So number three, protect yourself against opponents. You know, anytime you're you're playing risk, and and you'll notice that the titles are really more risk uh, based. The the board game and the content is really more the strategy. That's because I'm just so clever and trying to make this interesting. But as you'll see in the ideas section, when when you get there, uh, when we get there, you need to be super creative and find that balance between digital and real world activities. Um, 
and, and a great way to protect yourself. So I like to really stress that, that, you know, it's all about balance when, when you're marketing in these things, especially when you're going super deep in verticals. Balance is very important. Um, but, you know, another way to protect yourself from opponents is to establish partnerships and lock down good opportunities. Um, you know, the example I use is partner with relevant trade associations that your targets participate in. They usually have huge mailing lists that you can leverage for, for really, you know, great opportunities. Trade associations, I love trade associations. They're not as sexy as, you know, some other partnerships that some people can come up with, but they're usually a hundred percent targeted. If you're, if there's a trade association for engineers or there's a trade associations for freelancers or whatever that target is, you're looking for web designers and things like that. Um, there's going to be every single person on that mailing list that can use your product. So instead of, you know, spending all your day in Twitter or Facebook, hoping you find the people, here's a way to actually find those people. And when you're starting, it's super important to find as many people as possible. Uh, and I always say spend real time with your audience so they can only think of your brand or endorse you because you're in the room and they feel guilty to talk about any other um, product because it'll um, hurt your feelings. What I mean by that is, you know, when you partner with these trade associations, they're going to have meetup groups. They're going to have these other opportunities that you can actually go out in the real world. And I'm a big proponent of spending time with your customers in the real world. And, you know, if you're the only brand in the room and there's a meetup group or, or a Christmas party or whatever the event uh, might be, they're going to talk about you because you took the time to show up. So it's, it's kind of like a sneaky little trick, but it, it works really well. Um, so number four, know when you need to make a new move. You know, we talk about water jumps. We talk about all these different things. But, you know, once you own a vertical and let's say that vertical is web designers and you want to go to web developers or let's say you want to make a, a jump, a water jump and things like that. Um, you have to really keep momentum going. And when I say own a vertical, it's maybe 20 to 30% adoption. You, you know, chances are you're not going to own a vertical at like 80% or something like that, unless you don't have any competitors. Um, but once you own a vertical, you need to keep momentum going um, for so many reasons. You know, it, it looks good for your current user base because everyone likes to being with a winner. Um, it looks good for you, your staff. It's great for employee morale and corporate culture and all sorts of things. Um, winning a vertical is worth celebrating, but I always tell people um, that, you know, you're still far from the finish line. Celebrate it. Don't get distracted. Don't get too crazy and don't, you know, take your eye off the prize. And, and when you are ready to make a move, you have to make sure you make the right one. The reason you draw this out on the map or the reason I like to draw it out on the map is so you, you don't have to make any decisions really of what's next. You always know it's coming. Um, so when you're making a move, you don't try to go from, you know, Australia to North America or, you know, some hard to find or hard to, you know, unrelated vertical that still might be good for you, but you can't use any of the credibility or the testimonials that you've earned to to impress. You can't go from web developers to coffee roasters, uh, sort of the example, or you could, but it'd just be, you know, a little bit of banging your head against the wall and, and you know, people wouldn't make the, the connection right away. So number five, expand your dominion. Um, I don't really know what that means. It's a risk board game term, but um, how I sort of interpret it is it's all about momentum. Momentum is how you win, but the trick is to do it slowly. Um, think about anything in the real world. Do things too quick and you spread yourself too thin. Um, once you've spread yourself too thin, it allows other people to tear your work apart. The, the trick is all about focus and, and foundation work and stuff like that. Once you own a few verticals, the, the, a funny thing happens. You actually feel a tailwind. So you've started with the, the easiest verticals to, to sort of um, get on board. And you're going after the harder ones. But once you get to the harder ones, they actually become easier because, and it's a weird thing, you've done the foundation work. So you get this weird tailwind where the harder ones become, you know, much easier to talk to, much easier to understand, much easier to sign up and, you know, get to become customers. So number six Keep control of the game. That's, of course, everything when you're doing a board game or you're doing um, a business or anything. You have to keep control. So like I said earlier, 
don't get caught up on geography. You focus on the areas you can manage and then rinse and repeat somewhere else. Once you feel you have your area under control, you can start um, over somewhere else. Follow the same rules and stay close. Start in your city or the most viable city that you think is going to work. And you make the next big city a few hours away from your target. A lot of people think, you know, oh, if I'm in New York, I have to go to San Francisco next or thing when, you know, in New York, you can go to Philadelphia or you can go to Boston. These are like small little jumps following the same thing. Um, you know, going coast to coast or, or, you know, going from the UK to Scotland or all these things. I, I don't know, um, you know, Europe as well as I probably should, but there's probably a lot of differences that you'd have or little nuances that you'd have to really understand or do where just going kind of, you know, community, community, neighborhood to neighborhood, area to area would probably make everything just go a lot easier. So we keep talking about risk. I keep using this analogy. Remember, risk is a game about ruthlessly crushing your opponents. It's an arms race. So the army with the most people willing to fight for them and fight for the cause will always win. Um, Saul Colt's marketing risk isn't much different. You need people to care about your product, to talk about your product, and to actually like want to you know, get out there and scream from the rooftops. Um, so how do you find these people? Um, you find them by doing cool things and being creative. And, and that's sort of what I've built my career off of and, and things like that. But, you know, even I am the guy who makes everything look creative. And I'm the one that, you know, like I said at the beginning, is sort of flippant about how I do things. There's still a lot of strategy even in the creative stuff. And that's why, you know, I, I want people to understand where ideas come from and how ideas happen and things like that. So. I've given you the the strategy section um, of you know how to grow. Now I'm I'm going to go into the ideas section. But even in the ideas section, it's still a lot of strategy because you know as I'll explain through a bunch of different ideas, um, you always have to have a goal, work backwards, and figure out what you're doing. So, um, like the slide says. Strategy can be boring sometimes to some people, sometimes it isn't. Hopefully the ideas section um, makes up for it. Uh, but first a quote, businesses and music must need to better understand that creativity must be the foundation of the entire enterprise. It's not about making profit on each and every album. That, that's a quote from Clive Davis. Clive Davis is a, you know, one of the, the more, if not most successful music producers and music uh, executives in the world. I kind of love, to this quote because you know music is all about creativity um but they didn't use a lot of strategy in sort of building their their industry as things shifted and became more digital and stuff like that and and you know this quote is is like an onion it's layered in so many different ways um you know and, and obviously when you're building a presentation you always use quotes that are self-serving to yourself and stuff like that but i love the fact that you know, one, it's not about making profit on each and every album. Not every idea has to, you know, go directly to sales or directly to this or directly to that. Um, it really is about figuring out what the goal is first and working backwards. And, and that even speaks to the whole idea of marketing risk. It's more than just the board game analogy. I use the board game analogy to sort of talk about the, the growing and, and the strategy of finding customers. But Real risk and in, in, in taking risks is, is so important in business. It, it's sort of the yin-yang equation that makes companies great. Being creative needs to be managed, but it can't be smothered. And, you know, I've, I know in my career several times people have tried to smother me and put handcuffs on me, and it really affected, you know, the success of the business and, and obviously it affected, you know, my happiness and things like that um, because I know this stuff. I know this stuff backwards and forwards. And, you know, when you're – sort of trying to sell creative ideas it scares people risk scares people um so it's one of those things that you just have to find you know the the balance and i keep talking about balance and stuff but achieving genuine relevance for any brand is impossible without taking major risks i believe this um wholeheartedly uh it's just like it doesn't happen without taking risks um and just like strategy without creative and creative without strategy, you won't meet the goals 
you're reaching for unless you do both because like too many ideas just becomes a little fluffy and too much strategy without ideas uh, just doesn't work I, I like to sort of use the the description that um, if ideas are Microsoft Word and the strategy and the analytics and the the metrics are are um, spreadsheet without the idea you have no numbers to put in the spreadsheet and a lot of people love starting with the spreadsheet first but I, I don't believe that's possible so get comfortable i'm going to go through a bunch of ideas a, a bunch of things that i've done in my career uh sort of explain where they are why we did it you know where the idea came from and uh just you know just so you can see sort of what's possible what's possible, how things are done, whether they're successful or not, and sort of get a, a better understanding of, of, you know, how you can do these things for yourself. Um, so um, a, a good friend of mine is the CEO of a, a very, very successful, uh, healthy fast food chain called Freshie. Um, it's like a, you know, a salad and wraps and, and you know, company that, you know, you make your own salads and, and things like that. Um, you know, They've got over 100 locations in about, you know, 10 or 12 or 15 different countries. Um, very successful. A couple months ago or, or, you know, I don't know when this was, let's say May of this year, uh, McDonald's was having some problems, you know, and, and I love McDonald's. I grew up on McDonald's. It's sort of a shame to see them having so many problems. They lost their CEO. They're having, you know, they're closing stores worldwide and, and, you know, they're sort of the punching bag for fast food, which is unfortunate, um, because, you know, people still love fast food. There's, you know, that sentiment hasn't changed. It's just now people, when they think of fast food, they think of Chipotle. So taking advantage of that idea, we decided to do some punching on our own and, and you know, sort of say whether it's it's fair or not fair. Um, but we took out a, a full page ad in the newspaper and we wrote an open letter to uh, Steve Esterbrook, which is the new CEO. And um, basically the, the letter was beautifully written. You can see it in the slide. Uh, but the letter basically stated, hey, we know you're having some hard times. There's a lot of media that are, are sort of, you know, um, punching you guys while you're down uh, one possible way to restore your brand, restore um, face and, and generate more profits would be to partner with Freshy, put um, Freshy locations inside of McDonald's. So like 200 square foot footprint. And that way, you know, we're not telling people don't buy French fries anymore and milkshakes, but why don't you get a really great custom salad with your French fries and milkshake? Um, and, you know, we'll split all the revenue with you in any Freshy that inside of a, a McDonald's restaurant and it's a way for McDonald's to, you know, just basically, you know, renew people's love for McDonald's. Um, this went out and it was it was very well received. It got picked up in USA Today and about 11 other tier one um media places uh, and it got freshly a lot of attention mcdonald's never responded and, and the interesting thing about it was the goal was never to have mcdonald's respond uh the goal was to get you know the name freshy out there get it in some tier one uh, media places by doing something really cool if mcdonald's responded i don't know what the reaction would have been on the side of freshy uh because it would have actually been very expensive to put the restaurants in and stuff but this was a, a pure stunt and and i love doing this example first because you know one of the 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 main things people always ask is you know where do you come up with ideas and and you know you're so brilliant and handsome and devilishly handsome and brilliant that people always repeat stuff twice i don't know why but um when people ask where ideas come from i always tell them there is no such thing as a new idea um, I watch tons of TV. I watch tons of movies. I, I read, you know, four to five books a month uh, just because I'm in planes a lot and, and stuff like that. And the whole idea of, you know, ideas in general is to find something and, and make it your own and, you know, be inspired by something, take some chances. So the idea of this full page ad, uh, you know, going after McDonald's came, you know, 100% from that episode of Mad Men when uh, Don Draper took the full page ad out uh, in the New York Times and said they wouldn't uh, support tobacco advertising anymore. So 
don't be afraid to take someone else's idea. You know, you have to make it your own idea. You can't copy things 100%, but don't be afraid to be completely blatantly inspired by something else because that's, that's, you know, where ideas come from. Um, the other thing that I always tell people is magicians are the right answer to any question. If you, if you look at the slide, you see um, my magician friend here wearing a Zero T-shirt, and he's sitting on a cloud. I, I'm a big, big big fan of um taking ideas and making them super literal so zero for for if you're not familiar it's a cloud-based um cloud-based accounting solution for small business zero is who i work for i love zero um because we're cloud-based and and you know for people who don't know what that is it just means that you can use the product anywhere anytime from any device uh, and it'll always be updated I love the idea of actually, you know, marketing around this cloud idea and sort of taking things really literally. So I, I had a, I hired a magician and uh, I had him sit on a cloud for, you know, three hours, two and a half hours. And if you see sort of in the picture where he's looking over his shoulder, there's people taking pictures and people got really excited and it just became this really cool like photo opportunity. And, and that's the other thing. Um, marketing should really be art. When, when you ask yourself, you know, is this cool? Is this creative? The, the, the better question to ask yourself is, would anyone take a picture of this? Would anyone share this? Is this something that will start a conversation? So this particular thing started a big conversation because I happened to do it um, out front of um, one of our largest competitors' user conference. And, you know, people think that this was sort of like a, a jerky thing to do, but I, I'm going to explain the idea behind it. So I wanted to do a spectacle. I wanted to do something that, you know, was really interesting, but not sort of disrespectful. And I didn't want to, I wanted to do a polite disruption to let people know we were there, but I didn't want to hijack the whole conference and didn't want to go Greenpeace and hang banners from the, the roof of the building or anything like that. But I wanted to create a really interesting impact. I wanted people to take pictures. I wanted to start conversations. So by putting my levitating magician in front of their conference, a couple of things happened. Um, one, we, we got a lot of attention for our brand. You know, we're, we're a much smaller company than they are. So we started a conversation with people. People took tons of pictures. So the Twitter wall on the inside of the conference center was covered with our logo. So that's something I'm kind of proud of. And uh, the other thing was that, you know, they, they had hired Magic Johnson to be the one of their keynote speakers. And Magic was awesome. I, I, I didn't know if he'd be that interesting, um, but he was an amazing, amazing speaker. Uh, the only thing was the room was only three quarters full because I had a lineup outside of, you know, 75 to 100 people who are waiting to get their picture taken with my magician. So um, I, I sort of hit a lot of different um, happy points on my side of the sort of the ledger. But the main reason we were there, and this is the part where I, I sort of tell people I'm not a complete jerk, is the main reason that there is we have a lot of add-on partners and, and companies that build products based on our platform, you know, for, for different things like point of purchase displays or inventory or time management. And um, they also build things for our competitor. So they would, our, our, the people that support us also support our competitor, which we're completely obviously on board with. So we wanted to show up and support the people that supported us. So we did not give out um, any information about our product. We did not give out promo codes or discounts or anything like that. What we did give out was a little information postcard that explained who inside the building used um, QuickBooks as well as Zero, And we asked people to go talk to the people that, that support us. So we're showing sort of some of our, our marketing muscle and, and giving these people um, a bit of an opportunity to, to talk with some customers and things like that. Um, I believe, you know, making friends with food is always a, a good way to, to start a conversation. And, and I love this example. <coughs> Excuse me. I love this example because uh, it, it really shows about capitalizing on opportunities, um, taking some risks and, and you know, providing value. Uh, when you're being disruptive and doing something that some people would, would think is, is over the line, um, I think if you're providing value, you're always going to be on the right side of history. So uh, you can see my picture. I've got a food truck. Um, the part of this that you don't see 
is that um, we, we set up this food truck uh, in front of the, um, the California uh, State Capitol building. And, and the reason we did it was, um, and when I talk about partnering with associations and, and you know, doing things that are super targeted, uh, we found out that the uh, Cal CPA, the California um, Association of, uh, you know, Chartered Public Accountants, they were going to the state capitol building to speak to legislators and try to get their voice heard and, and get people to know that they they have wishes and things that they would love to um, get get heard about, you know, at the state capitol. Uh, and the process uh, of doing this was you show up at nine in the morning, they give you a 10 minute window. That window can be anywhere from nine to, to five in the afternoon. When you get your chance to speak to your legislator, you go and you get your 10 minutes and then sort of the next person comes in. Uh, we heard about this. We wanted to support these people. We did not want to go in and speak to legislators. That wasn't our uh, place. What we could do is entertain all the people that are waiting on the lawn uh, for their 10, 15 minutes with their legislator. So we brought a food truck. We fed them. You know, we created this long lineup. So we created a visual spectacle because, you know, we were providing free food. Uh, but, you know, free, really good food takes, you know, a couple minutes to prepare and cook and things like that. So while we had these people in the line, we were able to actually talk to them, uh, hear from them what they want to talk to the legislators about, talk about our product, get to know the, the association a little better. And, and also, again, add value. We fed these people. We sheltered them. We had a tent. You know, it, it was a beautiful day, um, but there was a, a bit of a fear for rain. So we knew we were going to be sort of the, the heroes and things like that. When you find these opportunities, it's risky because they um, they could have thrown us out. The the state capital people could have thrown us out. Um, a lot we could have actually you know really could have gone either way. But w when you're doing things for the right reason and when you're adding value, um, it usually always works out um, for the best. Um, I love this example. Nuvango is a company that um, you know I, I'm an advisor of. I love this brand so much. Um, it's an art marketplace. They have some of the best artists in the world putting the most beautiful art on products. So um, they started as a uh, as a cell phone uh, you know case uh, manufacturer and you know it just sort of grew. Now they they do clothing and fine art and all sorts of things um, and just love this company. Uh, a little while ago, you know, the, we, they went through a rebrand and they wanted to get the name out and, and get people to know that, you know, they've changed their name and they wanted to get people um, just sort of excited about the brand and, and what they were doing and their changes. Um, so had to come up with a, a, a cool idea to sort of get it out there. But at the same time, they wanted to actually welcome a lot more artists into the network. So it's, uh, you know, how, how do you do this? How do you get your name out? explain your value proposition, explain, you know, why people should care, but also, you know, get people to get excited about things. And the idea came up with, if you see the, the top picture on the slide, there's a hands holding um, pretty much what looks like a plain white piece of paper with a tiny bit of a uh, copy at the bottom. What it actually was is the back cover of High Fructose Magazine, which is an art magazine. Um, you know, it's cool kids art, really beautiful stuff and really in line with the new Van Gogh brand. Uh, we bought three back covers of High Fructose Magazine. And the first one that was published was a plain white page that said, have you ever wanted to be on the cover of High Fructose? Had a couple lines of instructions and basically said, you know, if you want to see your art on the cover of High Fructose, draw it right here. Not digitally, you have to go pen to paper or brush to paper or marker, marker to paper, draw something really amazing, you know, tweet it to us, mail it to us, fax it to us, email it to us, whatever. We want to see your amazing art um, because we're going to pick two people, uh, you know, to be on the next two covers of High Fructose Magazine. So, you know, it was amazing some of the the entries that people sent. You can see sort of the bottom uh, of just grabbed a couple from the internet, but people did amazing, beautiful work. And, and like I said, you always start with a goal and work backwards. So the, the goal here was, you know, we wanted to get our name out. We wanted people to get really passionate about our brand, but we also wanted to find amazing artists to, to welcome into, you know, the marketplace. So 
this was a way for people to actually self-identify themselves as being great artists with the level of quality that um, you know we wanted on the website. But they also were sharing our brand and sharing you know their work online associated with us, which you know helped both people you know in just great ways. And this is just super cool. Love this idea um, because you know anytime you can get someone to draw for four or five hours do something really beautiful um you know they're going to be thinking about your brand and they're going to get really passionate about your brand and make a really strong bond connection so um this this is one of my favorite ideas that you know i've ever come up with um staying with Nuvango just for a minute uh, another thing uh we did that sort of had a bit of a creative uh, edge to it but also had strategy was um we, we sponsored a, a interactive um, and music festival in Toronto called North by Northeast. And uh, what we did was in all the bathrooms and throughout different venues, we hung art up on the wall, framed art. And under the picture, there was the, the sticker there that says, good artist copy, great artist steal. And basically the idea was if you really liked the art that was on the wall, you just took it take it off the wall, walk off with it. Um, just make sure that you tweet that you took it so we can go put another piece up on the wall. Um, this is just product sampling. You know, it, we would have given a certain number of pictures out to people who are going to talk about it or review or, or anything. We just did it with an interesting story around it because by adding to the story, people felt like there was like an experience around it and there was something really fun so on the back of each picture it's uh, or uh, under the picture it said stolen property someone beat you to it not to fear we'll we'll be replacing the art daily uh, and you know tweet us to let us know that um there's no art here so we asked somebody to tweet after they get the picture and we asked someone to tweet even if they didn't get the picture so you know the myth is sort of growing and people are talking about it and, and all these things it's it, it's all about creating experiences and creating conversations so just like i said there's no new ideas and people say oh come on you're so handsome you've got all the ideas um it's the same for starting conversations it's easier than you think you know the these are sort of my my four really simple ways to start conversations and and you know all this is all these ideas are just getting people to talk word of mouth um how you do it is you force people to ask questions. Why am I allowed to steal this picture? Why am, you know, why are they, as Freshie is saying, McDonald's should put um, uh, another franchise location inside of their location? It doesn't make sense. You know, why is there a magician sitting on a, a cloud? Why is there a food truck? Why is this company feeding me? Um, make people scratch their heads because if they're scratching their heads, that's, you know, even if it's only 10 seconds, eight seconds, that's time that they are thinking about your brand and they're not thinking about anyone else. Um, try a hundred small little things. You know, if anything works, do that again. If it doesn't work, throw it out. The, the best thing about word of mouth is if it doesn't take off, it just means nobody saw it. It just means nobody heard about it. It's not going to blow up in your face. And, and I always say it's okay if no one shows up. And what I mean by that is, uh, I invite a lot of people to dinner when I travel. It gets very lonely. I don't like to eat alone. So I'll invite, you know, hundreds of people to, to come, you know, have dinner with me, you know, customers, things like that. Um, almost never more than like 10 or 15 people show up. It's last minute. It's, you know, people don't want to get in their car. Nobody cares really about hanging out with me. Um, but the reason I invite so many people is, you know, it doesn't matter if they show up. It matters that they know that you're doing this. It matters that they see signs of life. It's, you know, get them to scratch their head. Why is, you know, an accounting um, software provider inviting me for dinner? My my phone company doesn't do that. My, my you know, car manufacturer doesn't do that. You know, it's all these little things. Make people scratch their head. Make them ask questions. So if you look at the, the little four-pack of pictures here, there's a picture of me with a mime, 
And uh, this is probably the thing that um, most people uh, talk uh, online about uh, just because this story has become sort of like a, a big story, at least in my little world. But I, I hire mimes, clowns, and magicians to network with me all the time. Uh, I'm just one of these people that I'm more comfortable speaking to 100 people at a time on a stage than, you know, a handful of people. Uh, but if I have someone with me and someone uh, to network with, I'm, you know, I'll be comfortable. But if I'm alone, I'm the creepy alone guy. So if I hire someone creepier than me, um, it just breaks the ice. And when you're when you're networking with a, a clown, you're never the creepiest guy in the room, which I learned very quickly. And I kind of like sort of the, the balance. But I, I hire mimes all the time. And, and, you know, the guy in this picture was amazing. We, we did this thing where, you know, he would sort of hide a little bit. I would walk up to, you know, networking events. There's always eight people in a circle and, and stuff like that. I'd walk up and I would interrupt everybody and say, you know, hey, can um, can I tell you guys a story? And, you know, people are usually receptive. And I would tell the story about how my grandmother was really sick. And uh, and I'd say, you know, she she didn't die. So don't, don't, you know, spoil the, the, the story. Uh, but you know, she was really sick. And, and, you know, when she was at her, her worst moment before she got better, she, she took my hand and she said, promise me, you'll take care of your brother. And as soon as I said, brother, he would pop out from behind, you know, like somewhere and he'd be like a mime in a box or he'd be doing all sorts of things and it defused the whole situation. And then him and I would have this conversation and he would be miming, like basically my my elevator pitch and I would be, you know, we'd be playing charades kind of thing and and people would actually spend time and, and try to figure it out and wonder what was going on and they would tell that story. And, you know, I, I have the, the picture here of the caricature. Uh, I, I hired a caricature artist to come to a conference with me and be my networking partner because my idea was that if you're being drawn by this guy, you'll wait the minute or two minutes to get your picture because everyone's selfish, myself included. And it gives me time to talk to them and, and sort of like, you know, pitch them and stuff like that. So, um, something that was really, um, sort of funny and I, I get kicked out of conferences all the time because I'm awesome and I do fun things that people don't like fun. Uh, so I was asked to leave this conference because myself and my caricature artists were getting more attention than, um, you know, the people who, paid for sponsorships and bought booths. Uh, so when we were kicked out, you know, most people would just leave. But, you know, the whole idea of taking risks and sort of, you know, fighting for for your company and success is we just sat in, in outside on the, the curb and we started just anyone who used the conference hashtag, uh, the caricature artist would... Um, would draw them based on their Twitter avatar and we'd tweet the, to them and we'd invite them outside or we'd invite them for a drink or we would, you know, just have a conversation over Twitter. And it, it was amazing how well it was received and how much people liked it. Um, the, the bottom picture of, uh, you know, zero in, in the sky, zero sky writing. Again, talking about taking things literally, I never understood why a, um, a cloud-based, uh, product had never used clouds to advertise their product and so i, I hired a skywriter uh during the the national league baseball championship series last year uh you know san francisco giants we did it in san francisco i i wrote in the sky zero beautiful accounting software hashtag zero and i thought i did it over the stadium during a game and i thought the game was going to stop and there'd be a like tons of pictures and people were was going to be on TV and people were just going to um, go crazy. Uh, funny thing happened was that nobody at the baseball game cared, but you know, people in all four corners of the city really got excited by it because nobody had seen something like this before. And like, you know, the result was we owned Twitter for like five minutes and that may not sound like a, a great deal, but like owning Twitter for any number of time is, is, pretty impressive and we owned instagram for like 30 minutes because people literally it was like nine miles long of letters and and it just kept going up you know we wrote it a few hundred times because uh, funny thing about skywriting it actually vanishes in like 30 seconds uh so we just kept writing it over and over and over for an hour <clears throat> um people loved this and people talked about it but you know again we force people to scratch their heads and think about us and talk about us and created experiences. And, you know, like you see the iPhone here and I, I'm going to sort of 
skip a couple stories because there literally is like a hundred stories here. Um, but the iPhone, I went out and bought the very first iPhone like eight years ago. And um, I went out and I, you know, like a sheep, I, I wanted to be part of the, the cool kids gang. Um, when the second generation of iPhone came out, I bought the second generation because the first generation phone I bought, I had to jailbreak because it wasn't available in Canada. And that's where I live. Uh, so when it was available in Canada for the second generation, I, I'm not very technically savvy. So I didn't want to keep jailbreaking this thing and, and you know, possibly ending up with a, a phone that was useless. So I, I got the second generation. And I was thinking, what am I going to do with my first generation iPhone? So I, I gave it away in a contest through the newsletter for the company I was working at. And, you know, technically nobody should have really cared about having like a jailbroken iPhone that was more than gently used and pretty scuffed up and, and uh, mistreated. Uh, but I surrounded a story around it. I created an experience that got people really excited. So the experience that I created was it was Win Saul's iPhone. And on the back, it, I had it engraved with my name and you've won Saul's iPhone and things like that. Um, I didn't say you've won. It's just like, this is Saul's iPhone, blah, blah, blah. But the experience I created around it was, you know, in the contest, I told people, um, you know, when, when, if you win it, I will ship it to you uh, in a Ziploc bag, sealed, and on the glass will be two of my thumbprints, very clear and obvious to see. And the story was, you weren't supposed to activate it, you weren't supposed to use it as a phone, you're supposed to keep it on you at all times, and, and if you accidentally killed somebody, uh, like O.J. Simpson or something, you'd put the phone next to the dead body, and you know I would be the, the number one suspect, and you'd have 48 hours to get out of the country or the city or wherever you want to do. Um, and, and it was incredible how many people applied to win the phone. I have no idea if they wanted the phone or they actually had plans of killing somebody. But either way, people talked about it. People got excited about it. It was a way of just repurposing something that, you know, wasn't very valuable and, and actually making it super value, valuable. Um, if you see the, the the little banner here that says he's looking professional online invoicing for freelancers, I, I used to work for another invoicing company besides uh, Zero, and um, you know again this is my favorite story of all time. Uh, I will say every story I tell you today in this presentation is true. I've done it. You know I could tell you where the idea came from, right to execution, right to results. Uh, this is the one story in the presentation that didn't happen, and and I like to give this example because I love the story, but it's also about balance and managing risk. And, you know, there is such things that are too risky. I don't think this was too risky, but it did, you know, go beyond the, the comfort level of other people in the company. And that's a really important thing. Um, risk can be anything. It's, you know, whatever the, your comfort level is. I always tell people, know where that line of good taste is or what you can get away with and cross it by two baby steps because the two baby steps are going to be where the memories uh, come from and where the, the conversations come from. But you have to know where that line is and you have to not, you, you only go two baby steps. You don't go 10 feet past the line because that's when you can really like sort of damage your brand or, or insult people. But so here's the story. I'm in the office one day and the the you know and the guy here with the tie in the briefcase was our you know company mascot for five years. One day the CEO says, you know, we should really kill the mascot. Anyone have any ideas to come up with something new? And uh, again, super literal. I hear kill the mascot. I wanted to literally kill the mascot, and my I, so I went and I wrote a two page strategy document that fo focused around. For the next six months, you know, Ivan, which was the name of the mascot, we would keep running him in banner ads. But in, you know, every couple of weeks, he'd get a little thinner and a little thinner and a little thinner until finally he was like, you know, on intravenous and he was sitting in a chair and then he was in like a hospital bed. And then one day we would just release a press release and say that he died and you can make donations to this charity. And oh, by the way, we have a new mascot and here he is. Um I love this idea so much. You know, it's just, it, it's so funny to me on so many different levels. I totally understand why it made people uncomfortable, but that was the point to get people to notice something. And sometimes to get people to notice, you have to sort of take them out of their comfort level and get people to think and scratch their heads. Um, but I, I still think that is the funniest idea ever. And hopefully someday someone will do it. Um, and, and so that brings me to this, this page called building a myth. And, you know, 
killing a mascot would definitely build a myth. I, I tell people the way you build a myth is you never confirm and you never deny anything. Um, you know, it, it's just that's how it works. You leave out parts of the the answers on purpose parts of the 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 mystery of things um you know when people say why are you doing things anything you tell them is going to be less interesting than what they fill in the blanks for themselves so you have to purposely leave blanks for people so the the myth grows and grows and grows if you see the the picture of me um you know waving in a thora.com jacket that was me on a digital board in times square so that's like me and you know Marky Mark and and the Funky Bunch and stuff. We've both been on digital boards in Times Square, and how I how that um, happened was, I, I was sitting in Times Square one day in New York City, and I saw unhappy tourist after unhappy tourist go up on the digital board for American Eagle Outfitters. So I went in the store and I asked what the deal is because all these people are unhappy, and they said, oh, anytime you buy anything. We, we take your picture, we put it up on the board. So that got me really excited for the possibilities. So I waited, you know, like eight months until I was back in town and I had like branded clothing to wear. And I went and I bought a $3 keychain. And for $3, I was on a digital board in Times Square. Uh, it was a rainy day. Not many people saw it in real life, but I took a picture of it. And, um, you know, I've told this story hundreds of times i've shared the, still to this day the most viewed picture of myself online and you know people just think it's really cool that i figured out how to get a digital board on times square not many people know that it only cost me three dollars um people just like the idea of it and they've filled in the blanks and and you know I can only imagine some of the stories, you know, I, I slept with somebody or I used a bunch of favors or this or that. Um, those stories are going to be always more interesting than the truth. So you have to leave blanks in to, so people can, you know, create those stories. I just say, this is me on a digital board, you know, I, and, and people sort of get really excited because it's a cool, unusual thing and they fill in the blanks themselves. Um, creating a myth. If you see the two bottles of mustard, uh, I, I was reading a, a book called Word of Mouth Marketing by Andy Cernovitz and I love Andy. I think he's, you know, one of the smartest people in the world of word of mouth and in the book or on his uh, website, a blog, I don't remember, but he talked about how he loved this particular mustard that was only available in Toronto, the city I live in. So I went and I got it for him and I mailed it to him. Um, you know, but, you know, I could have just mailed it to him with a note and and sort of been done with it. But, you know, everything you do has to be about creating a myth. So, you know, what I did was I took a Sharpie and I wrote all over these mustard bottles because I wanted him to think of me every time he made a sandwich and every time he opened his fridge and, and things like that. So I had my contact information. And, and, you know, I explained to him that, you know, sort of friendly and humorously that his days as the best word of mouth marketer are, are over because uh, I'm on the scene and, and I'm going to be the, you know, the best in the world and stuff like that. So, you know, you could look at his taunting, you could look at his, this. It was friendly and he knew me and, you know, we've become friends since. But it's really about creating things that last and people are going to like not forget and are going to want to share and, and stuff like that. So um, early in my career, I, I, you know, I worked for um, a, a real estate startup called uh, Zucasa. It was a real estate search engine to find homes. And, you know, we did things a little differently. A lot of the stuff that we did, this is about eight years ago, but um, a lot of the stuff that we did now is commonplace. We were one of the first people to tell you like what the school was like uh, uh, attached to the home that you were, uh, you know, buying and what walk scores were and things like that. Now all these things are commonplace. Um, but one of the things we did to get excitement for our, our little you know search engine was um, we, we got an exclusive listing for the baseball stadium in Toronto, the Rogers Center, where the Toronto Blue Jays play. And if you wanted to really find out all the information about the Rogers Center, uh, you had to come to our website. We made an awful on purpose real estate video, you know, giving you a walkthrough of the building and talking about the 375 foot ceilings and, you know, dinner for you know hosted dinner party for 52,000 people and all these like cliche things and that video got a lot of play and and the site got a lot of attention and stuff like that and the reason we were able to do this was we were just a startup very very um 
poorly funded, you know, scrappy, bootstrappy kind of startup. But one of our, you know, investors was Rogers Communications, which is one of Canada's largest uh, telecommunications companies. So people think of Rogers as a billion dollar company. And, but just because they're associated doesn't mean that, you know, our company had money to spend on marketing. So that so being creative we didn't have money, but we had access to something. You know, I could make a phone call and ask if we could do a stunt at the Rogers Center. And they said yes. And we actually did properly list the building on our website. It was all legit. If somebody had a billion dollars, they could have owned the Rogers Center and stuff like that. Um, but, it was, you know, it's about looking around and seeing what's available to you. You know, barter and dead inventory are things that I use a lot sort of in my toolkit. This was, you know, not quite barter, but this was certainly a favor and a favor of like a high profile sort of magnitude. So get, getting to barter and dead inventory, you know, one of the things not everyone knows about me is uh, I, I was the person that launched Zipcar, the car sharing service in Canada. Not the whole company, just the Canadian uh, entity of uh, Zipcar. And the first year that we were in business, we had um, had about you know 300 uh, members of the service. Um, we'd only been going for a few months now uh, at this point, and uh, it was Christmas time, and had about $300 to do a Christmas party. Um, there was only two employees, myself and the fleet manager. Uh, you know, so we could have went out for a nice dinner, maybe brought a couple of our parking vendors and things like that. Uh, but instead, uh, you know, I had all these cars that nobody was driving at the time, and so we had members, but the members only used the cars every now and then. So I had an idea to get people to drive the cars because it was, you know the nature of that business is people need to see the cars on the road to get excited about them, not see them in parking spots. Uh, so I gave out thousands of hours of free driving um, in barter. And what I did was it was we threw the greatest Christmas party ever where we had um, a rock venue to um, a rock venue, two bands, you know, booze, you know, media sponsors, all these things where I traded driving you know in exchange for all these things we wanted so we could have this really amazing party and uh you know it, it was a great event because you know one we got plenty more members because they saw that we were doing cool things um we had people with free driving credits so they were actually going out and using the cars which just helped with like the myth and the brand and all sorts of stuff like that um but we also had this like really cool event where um you know we were able to do all of it and i didn't even spend the 300 dollars that we had as our our budget uh so that's sort of our our you know you got to think of dead inventory and barter. So dead inventory was the cars because nobody was using them. Barter was, you know, you've got something that um, I want. I've got something that you want. Let's figure out how to make, you know, better things from there. Um, I always talk about using customers. You know, in the, the previous example of Zipcar, the two bands that performed at our, our event were members of Zipcar. So it's reciprocal. In this example, I, you know, Thora, which is an, uh, you know, it was a technology startup I worked uh, at early in my career, uh, helped them launch. Um, Thora was way ahead of its time, and if it was around today, it'd be worth like a zillion dollars. But essentially, what Thora was was it indexed the entire internet um, every day, and at the time, it was really only Twitter and Google uh, that were indexing the entire internet and and Thora. Um, so you can imagine it was pretty expensive. Um, what they did, though, they indexed the entire Internet, and through um, uh, an amazing algorithm, uh, they knew what, you know, th they ranked all the most talked about stories of the day. So you could actually click on entertainment or on sports or world news or anything and find out these are the top 10 stories um, based on Internet chatter and Internet comments and Internet sort of discussions. So um, one year at South by Southwest in 2010, we were, you know, there promoting Thura. And so um, the way we did it was every night I created a four page newspaper. So from midnight to about one in the morning, I was doing the, the Photoshop and laying out this newspaper. In the paper was a page of brand new comics. Um, so every every day we had new comics and relevant comics that told stories of South by Southwest that day. So they knew that these weren't done ahead of time. Uh, we had one story that we wrote, and uh, and then we had the top ten stories. And the, and the inside 
paper, two pages of the newspaper was just marketing collateral, explaining what Thor was and stuff like that. Um, but if you see this picture uh, of the woman here, that, that woman is Krista Nair. She's a friend, someone who really loved Thor. She was a, a, an advocate, someone who talked about it a lot. So, you know, just like we got people to perform at the, the Zipcar show, uh, I, I picked someone who really loved Thora and gave them sort of a, a spotlight and sort of rewarded them for, for being good to us. Everything you do should include your customers because your customers are, are what keeps businesses alive. You know, ego should never come into it. It's all about treating your customers really great. Um, I'm going to skip this story because we're going super late. And this is like an hour long story of that involves, you know, people sleeping in my hotel room and, and all sorts of things. Um, but uh, I am going to explain laugh, then cry. So um, laugh, then cry is sort of my formula on how to come up with great ideas. And, and, you know, I'm going to share with you guys. So I know there's a lot to sort of digest. You've got your marketing risk for strategy, and now you've got laugh and cry for ideas. But, you know, like I promise once you sort of digest it all, it's going to make perfect sense. So hopefully everyone here knows uh, what Arrested Development is. Um, and if you know the TV show Arrested Development, you know the, the Blues Banana Stand. It was, it was practically a character on the show. Um, here's how I used Arrested Development in a real-life way to stand out from the crowd and make people laugh, think, and cry. Uh, Laugh, think, and cry. I'm going to go obviously explain a little deeper, but this is the simplest way to know if your idea is is a good idea. Um, so a few years ago, I was given 10 days to come up with a, a trade show booth for a financial services conference. The, the reason uh, I didn't um, have very much time is we made a last minute decision to exhibit and the company I worked for at the time didn't have trade show booths. We didn't, we wouldn't spend $10,000 on a, on a booth or anything like that. And if you've ever been to a financial services conference, you know that people spend like $50,000 on booths, you know, because it's all about showing you're trustworthy and you're financially sound and successful. Um, and, and that's where, you know, this is a really important takeaway. If you can't or don't feel like competing on other people's terms, you just change the rules. And this is something I've done throughout my whole career. I can't stress enough how important it is. Just, just change things up. And the way we change things up or I change things up at this particular conference was, Instead of having a crazy, you know, seventy thousand dollar fancy booth, I um I hired a carpenter to make me an almost exact replica of the Bluth banana stand, and that was our booth at this financial services conference. So if you can imagine, fancy, 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 we've got a a, a nine foot high banana, and and we're giving out actual bananas on them. Um, this idea is so brilliant um, because, as you can see from the slide. Usually, if this is done in a live room, people just lose themselves with laughter right there. Um, but it's a perfect example of laugh, think, cry. So here's how you know I, I sort of go deep on it. Um, in the laugh category, and, and the idea of laugh, think, cry is if you can hit all three places, you've got a great idea. But at the bare minimum, you want to hear two, hit two out of three. And if you only hit one of them, it's probably not a fully um, formed idea. So under the laugh category, fans of Arrested Development got the joke right away and they, they appreciate it. They just thought it was the funniest, most clever thing ever. People who didn't make the connection of, or know of Arrested Development thought it was just something interesting and unusual. And either way, people needed to see the booth. Um, that's super important because when you're, you know, you're doing a trade show, all you really care about is that people come, you get to talk to them, you get to pitch your product or service, you get to find out what, what they're interested in, things like that. So under the think category, seeing a 10 foot high banana anywhere is going to make you think, seeing one in a financial services conference is going to make you scratch your head. And, uh, and when you even go further than that, instead of giving out, you know, pens or other sort of traditional conference swag, we gave out a banana. Um, when you're giving out bananas at an event from a banana stand where it doesn't make sense and you're scratching your head, you're going to want to see what the booth is and find out what the catch is. And, you know, that's really interesting because most times at, at conferences of all type or trade shows, people stare at the floor, they stare at their feet, they don't want to make eye contact, they don't want to deal with you, they don't want to come to your booth, they don't want to waste their time, your time, any of that stuff. We actually came up with an idea to get people to want to stand in line and talk to us, find out what the deal is, and find out what the catch is. So that's that's pretty interesting. 
um, create an emotion. So when I say cry, laugh, think, cry, cry is just like a, a real interesting sort of um, short form for create an emotion. Uh, the emotion doesn't have to be tears, but it has to be some sort of emotional connection, like a like a long distance, you know, TV, uh, long distance phone calling commercial from the 80s that it would always make you cry. So how we create an emotion is the fact that we chose Arrested Development to use our as our platform. This was a show with a rabid fan base. The idea spoke to those people and made an instant impact. People who were super fans of Arrested Development sought out the people who didn't know the reference and they were explaining it to them at our booth. So, you know, we had other people kind of like working for us, becoming advocates for our idea and our product and stuff like that. Um, people who never heard of the show just kind of thought that it was interesting because, you know, there's that business connection of, of you know, fruit stand or lemonade stand and, and things like that. So, you know, even people who didn't get the joke, there was emotional triggers for people who, who weren't, you know, emotionally involved uh, with the show. And as for actual crying, uh, I like to say this was done by the people on either side of us in our rows who actually spent, you know, $50,000 for their booths and we were getting more attention. So, was this a success? Um, here are some stats. One third of all the tweets from the conference hashtag were about our booth. Conference attendees suggested we win a prize for best booth without an actual prize existing. We were included in most of the coverage and wrap up posts from the conference, and we gave out 2,000, um, about, you know, just over 2,000 bananas. Uh, and on each banana had a sticker, kind of like the Del Monte or Dole sticker. Instead, we replaced our sticker with the logo of the company and a unique URL to go to a landing page to find out more about our services. And 65% of the people who got a banana checked out the link. 65% um, is ridiculous because you do a direct mail campaign and you do something, you're, you're crossing your fingers and hoping for 7% or 5%. Those are kind of the industry norms. Um, because we created this really crazy different experience, um, people were really excited about it and they checked out the link. So my last example, um, a company called Urban Dig, um, you know, as you, you guys will see from uh, hearing these stories, I've done a lot of different things, either you know as an employee or a consultant level. Uh, Urban Dig is one of my favorite examples uh, because I, I really loved this, this product. It's not around anymore, which is unfortunate, um, but the, the thesis of the idea was um, you had two hours to kill in a city you've never been to. What are the coolest things to do in that city that you wouldn't find in a photo's guide? So, you know, it would be things like, you know, best pizza, vinyl record shops, vintage clothing stores, dive bars, you know, street art. Like those are sort of the things. And and, and the, the interesting thing was we, you know, I talk about all my ideas can range from, you know, inexpensive to very expensive. This was zero dollars. We had zero dollars to market this this product and these are some of the ideas and things that, that I used. And when you have no money, the, the best thing to do is leverage other people's platforms. Um, so if you see here, there's a grilled cheese sandwich with our company logo uh, in the sandwich. And the title of the eBay auction was Grilled Cheese Sandwich with Spiritual Image. This is playing off the fact that, you know, every decade or so, Jesus or the Virgin Mary shows up in a pierogi or a piece of toast or something like that. We um we were making grilled cheese sandwiches and our, our our rabbit logo showed up in a grilled cheese sandwich so we figured it had to be uh you know sort of a a, a message from God and when when you know spiritual images show up in food you're supposed to sell them so we put it up on eBay this was a no cost auction we made it twelve thousand five hundred dollars to um, buy it because in truth it was just Photoshop and we didn't want anyone to actually buy it but we wanted to get attention. This was just sort of a whimsical idea to see what happened. And, you know, I, I shared it with a bunch of friends and I shared it online and asked people to support it. Um, and, and what happened was so many people went and viewed this because I guess a lot of people search eBay for um, Jesus and food that um, we tripped the algorithm on eBay from so many views that it became a hot auction. And it was on the front page of eBay eBay.com eBay for seven days. At the end of those seven days, it was viewed by over 32,000 people. 7,000 of those people checked out our website, and 4,000 of those 7,000 downloaded the app. 
Um, this costs us no dollars. It's just you know some Photoshop, some creativity, and leveraging someone else's platform. Um, I already mentioned I spent a lot of time in airplanes and hotel rooms and have free time. I wrote about 200 misconnections on uh, Craigslist. For those of you who don't know uh, what misconnections are, it's basically um, a place where if you see a beautiful girl on the subway and are afraid to talk to her, you can run to Craigslist and say, hey, beautiful girl, I saw you on the subway and I was afraid to talk to you. Um, if you are afraid to talk to me too, um, please connect with me. Uh, I wrote like 200 of them, all had the same sort of story arc. Boy meets girl, girl meets boy, boy meets boy, girl meets girl. Um, just about when someone's going to say I love you or ask for a phone number or do something, you know, um, they get interrupted somehow with a guy in an UrbanDig.com t-shirt or the UrbanDig.com truck drove by and splashed us with a puddle and all these things. It's just like a silly way of getting the name out there over and over and over and pique people's curiosity about UrbanDig and seeing if they'd go to the website. Um, so 3,000 people went uh, to the website from Craigslist and about 800 people download the app. Again, didn't cost a penny, just time. Um, the, the biggest thing and the most time consuming thing I did was I, I picked a fight with uh, PETA uh, because our logo was a rabbit and PETA is all about protection of animals. Um, we started just fighting with PETA online and, and um, you know, and, and it, it was interesting because it was a fake Twitter account and PETA, I was basically just fighting with myself and talking with myself, but um, I did this for a month before launch. So it wasn't just a week. Uh, it was really, you know, just sort of trying to build support and getting people to see it and ask questions and scratch their head. And, uh, you know, and we did little things like photo shoot with like people in rabbit costumes and all sorts of things. And we just kept, you know, having this conversation back and forth between Pete and myself. And, you know, and it wasn't just, PETA wasn't just talking to us. They were um, they were doing all sorts of crazy things. So we were launching Urban Dig at a conference called Grow Conference. You can see the hashtag uh, LP Grow. So um, what we did was we um, for for a month ahead of time, PETA was you know anyone who used the conference hashtag uh, was asking for support to help stop um, stop Urban Dig and. You know, they were saying, oh, you're going to the conference. Let's meet up and, and get together and, and, you know, trying to make it look as legitimate as possible that it was a real account. They weren't just blinded by Urban Dig Rage. They would talk about Pam Anderson and, you know, and um, <clears throat> Kareem Kanji, who, uh, you know, ran a, a social agency at the time. He reached out to offer help and because a lot of the things that I would write was, we're new at this Twitter stuff and, you know, are we doing it properly? Trying to, you know, Illicit conversation. He offered to um, give us a, a Twitter lesson, <clears throat> and our response was, "Would love to talk to your agency as long as you don't eat meat, wear leather shoes, or use penicillin." Ethics hashtag love rabbits. So, like, we never broke character. We never did any of that stuff. And and you know, <clears throat> this is possibly the favorite thing I've ever tweeted in my life. I think it's hilarious. Next time a close family member dies, why not make a lucky keychain out of their foot and leave the rabbits alone? <clears throat> Two retweets is criminal. This thing should have like broke the internet. It's so funny. Um, but um, we kept this charade up right up until launch day. <clears throat> and and we went one step further, and this is the only thing that we actually spent money on. We, we spent like a hundred bucks, and we hired some people off Craigslist. Craigslist, you know, gotta love Craigslist to pick it the the event that we were launching at. So if you could picture it, uh, it's a high school gym with a bunch of like bridge tables. Of, you know, all these startups are begging for people's attention. We had five people at the front door with signs saying, who speaks for the rabbits? Stop urban ding. Uh, you know, it'd say like rabbits, friends, not food, all sorts of things. And, you know, every, you know, fancy investor or tech journalist or people that were coming to the event, they would, um, they would get stopped and almost harassed by our Craigslist people. So the, as soon as they'd get into the gym, they'd come right to our table and say, do you guys know what's going on out there and what's going on? And we were the story of the event. Um, so by creating this sort of negative air around us, we used sort of trickery and, and, um, and um, <laughs> guilty feelings or whatever um, to, to become the story of the event. And, you know, it's, it's a, a really great case study of what you can do with no money. Um, I'm going to skip this because that doesn't 
uh, it's not relevant right now, but all these ideas were born using the laugh, think, cry formula. And it, so, like, it shows, you know, it really makes sense if you sort of get it. And uh, Seth Godin agrees with me. Uh, it says, instead of outthinking the competition, it's worth trying to outlove them. I think there's so much value in um, just actually showing some attention to your love and uh, showing attention to your audience and getting them to know that you care about them. It makes a huge difference. Um, so in closing, and I use that because my mom wishes that I was a lawyer, if you remember nothing else from my talk, remember these few things. Take risks. It is so important. Like, if you're not willing to take a risk, why are you bothering doing whatever you're doing? Like, starting a business is a risk. Putting your career in someone else's hands is a risk. Crossing the street is a risk. <clears throat> Excuse me. Your risks, you take risks every day, but are you taking them in your work where it could actually matter? Without taking risks, all you can expect is mediocrity and no one notices mediocrity. Um, there's so much mediocre BS out there. Like, you don't want to be in that thing. Um the other important thing to remember is make girls laugh, make girls think, make girls cry. Um, that is the formula for um, knowing if your idea is good. Again, I can't stress it enough. If your idea only does one, accomplishes one of those things, it's not quite there yet. Two of those things, it's probably okay. If you can actually do all three things, um, you've got yourself a crazy good idea. Um, you know, I said this already, this is a repeated slide, but marketing risk is more than just a board game analogy. Um, you know, risk is, you know, what makes companies great, you know, calculated risks. But, you know, remember, it's about the balance and it's really about what your level of risk is and what your brand personality is. For some people, taking a huge risk is just speaking conversationally. And if that's all you're comfortable with, fine. Take that level of risk because you have to be making an effort. And, you know, once you get a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more comfortable, you'll see that that line of risk will change a little. Um, I, this is one of my favorite quotes that I came up with is best reason in the world or one of the favorite tweets that I've come up with. Best reason in the world not to do things the way most people do them is that most people are not successful. Um, you know, I, I say copy people and be inspired and all those things. Um, and I, I'm not, you know, backpedaling or anything like that. But it's really important to stand out from the crowd and and sort of know where that line of good taste is with your customers and step over the line. Um, crossing the line, I said this already, it's where the conversations happen. Um, don't cross too far. You want to shock people not to stun them. But you have to know where that line is. And the only way you find out where that line is, by spending time with your customers, talking with them, even digitally, um, and going out and figuring out what you can get away with. Um, trying too many things from this talk wouldn't be a good idea because mostly I spoke of sleeping with people I care about. And if you slept with them, I, I'd cut you. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense because I skipped the whole sleeping with people story. Um, but pretend you heard this really awesome story just filled with nudity. Um, my wish is that this talk will actually inspire you um, just to do some different things and, you know, like form some real relationships, dream up some cool ideas. If you want to do these ideas, feel free, do them, because I already said there's no such thing as a new idea, but it's really more about um, taking some chances and stepping over the line. Um, and, and, you know, and, and when you're doing these things and you're creating myths, stuff happens. You'll see this email about somebody who overheard some people talking in a Denver airport about a talk I gave, and he went over and created an experience for them. Um, it's so important. Wrap everything in an experience because experiences are just, they're fun. And that's what people are, are really um, dig and stuff like that. Um, also remember, I am very romantic, which is just something that everybody should know. Um, so that is my whole talk on marketing risk. I hope you um, enjoyed it and got something out of it. If you have any questions, reach out to me anytime, either email, uh, phone, or, or Twitter and stuff like that. Um, and now I will answer some questions. So.